welcome back to a Coffee with Alien Resistance. We've got myself, Guy. And Paradox. Today we're actually uh, have our first guest for Coffee with Alien Resistance, Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, a lot of people that have been around the Alien Resistance and the Ancient of Days scene know him very, very well. Aside from being the author of the thriller suspense novel, The Facade, Mike is working on the sequel to The Facade, The Portent. He's about a third to 40% through. And rather than just doing a lame reading of your bio or anything, I'll just ask you, as if you and I just met at a little party or something like that, oh, hey, I hear you're the author of this book, The Facade. Tell me about your background, Mike, and what led into the writing of The Facade. Well, uh, my background is not anything that would be official as far as ufology. Uh, My background is academic. My expertise is biblical studies, biblical theology, specifically Old Testament, or what we like to call Hebrew Bible uh, in academia. And it was during my, uh, what should have been my first year of my dissertation, I was just kind of burned out. I wanted to take a break, and I thought, hey, I've, I've always wanted to write a novel. Why don't I do that instead of writing my dissertation? So it didn't take too long to talk myself into doing that, because like I said, I just didn't want to write the dissertation. So I had really what I thought was a good idea. I'd always been interested in UFO stuff, paranormal stuff, and I'd gone through graduate school listening to Coast to Coast for four or five years. (laughs) That was sort of an education, but, you know, I tend to pursue things academically, so I, you know, had all sorts of research material and the things that I was interested in. And I thought, why don't I marry the two here? Why don't I write a sort of a theological, paranormal, sci-fi kind of thriller? Just take the time and sort of take a break from school and do that. And so that's what I did. I worked on it for six months. First draft took me six months because that was literally all I did. And then sent it out to a few people and got some feedback and made some changes. And so really in seven, eight, nine months, I had this manuscript that became known as The Facade. It's an excellent book. We both read it. Two or three times. <laughs> it's really engaging. Yeah, I've read it two or three times, too. So. <laughs> I remember reading it on a PDF screen back in Roswell at the Alien Resistance storefront. I think you sent it to me directly, but a lot of times when people talk about books that they can't put down, you know, 10, 12 years ago, however long this was, I remember like reading on a PDF my computer screen your book that I couldn't put down for hours on end into the night and then wake up and pick up where I left off and keep reading. It's that, that good. Yeah, that, that's dedication right there if you can do it on a PDF screen. I've had people tell me that they got it, and other than going to the bathroom, that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. For like 24 hours or whatever it took them to read it. So that's dedication. I'm impressed. Well, that's captivating. Yeah, I mean, that's a compliment to you. It really is that captivating. You kind of feel like you're in a movie. I bet you've heard that a lot, right? I actually have heard that a lot, and I don't know if there's any correlation to it, but I had never tried fiction before. I'd written lots of academic stuff. And I find myself doing the same thing now uh, with the sequel. But I sort of, you know, every point in what I had outlined, what I wanted to do, I had to run it through my head as though I was watching it on TV or, or you know, on a movie or something like that. You know, who's in the room? Who's there? What are their expressions? You know, what's going on? All that kind of stuff. So I, I literally run it through my head, you know, 12, 15 times, you know, and then as I'm doing that, I think of potential problems in, in dialogue and different directions it could go and things like that. And so I'll take notes on that. The chapter that I'm getting ready to do right now, I'm, I'm actually in the same sort of process with that. You know, once I'm into it, then I, I know what's going to happen in the chapter and I get it down and then I go back and, you know, I, I invariably change things in dialogue and, and all, all that sort of thing. But yeah, I have, I have heard that and I, I guess it might be a consequence of how I do it. You know, I, because I, I wasn't really trained to do anything different. So maybe that maybe there's a correlation there. So you self-published it. We know that mm-hmm. originally, your first publication. Yep. You know, now there's a special edition of the facade that has, well, I don't know, a two- or three-page, I don't know if you've seen that yet, two- or three-page sort of the story behind how the facade came to be. You know, I don't even know if I actually ever told you that, but there's that in it, and then there's more of a thoroughly annotated, up-to-date bibliography, and then there's the first five chapters of the sequel in in the special edition. But I know your publisher would want us to mention the special edition, and you said it's got the additional features of how the story, how the facade came about. 
Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, the the whole self publishing thing at the beginning. What literally happened was I had this manuscript and I uh, I sent it out and one of my friends who lived on I guess about an hour away in Wisconsin because you know I was in graduate school at the time. He came over for the weekend after he had read it and you know was just sort of blown away by it and said, well, you need to do something with this. And I said, okay, well, you know, why don't you play publicist and we'll figure out you know how this all works. So the joke was, you know, we're going to we're going to call Art Bell and we're going to you know try to get on coast to coast. You know, we thought it was ridiculous because our impression was that there was this, you know, imperial guard or phalanx around Art Bell <laughs> that you'd, you'd never get through to him. You know, and so we thought, you know, I got to go back to my dissertation. And, you know, of course, you know, he, he was a chaplain at a hospital in uh, Racine. And so, you know, we are more or less going to go about our normal lives here and we'll figure something out at some point. Is this Doug? Yeah, this is Doug. And, uh, you know, he, he uh, sort of said he would play publicist. So he contacted Art Bell. And literally the next day, I came home from uh, school, from teaching. And Drina met me at the door of my wife. And she said, you're not going to believe who just called. And, you know, she told me, you know, and I, oh, come on. You know, you got to be kidding. No, it was Art Bell. And you got, you're supposed to call him back. <laughs> so so I did, you know. And, and uh, I found out then, and of course, I, I know from experience now, that they never schedule anybody more than two weeks out. So it was just, okay, what do we do now? Because I don't really have a book, you know, and, and we just never thought this would happen this way. And so it was sort of this, this sort of rush panic, you know, operation to, to get something in the works, which we managed to do incredibly in, a, in really about a week. But, you know, since then, I've actually, I, I could go through some different episodes if, if you wanted to talk about them, but I actually prefer the idea that it's an underground sort of thing. It's a word of mouth sort of thing, because I'm quite skeptical that a normal Christian publisher would ever let anything like this get through the filter. You know, I, I've had the experience of Basically, that not happening and leaving the conversation with quotes like we're trying to decide if we want to set trends or follow them. And, uh, you know, people just not wanting to go with it because it was so different. And it wasn't, you know, Buffy from the Amish country meets the pastor and marries the pastor's son just before the rapture, you know, kind of thing. It's it's not a little it's closer not, to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's it's not formulaic, it's not cartoonish, it, it, it's none of these things that so much of Christian fiction is, and so I kind of prefer it, you know, sort of operating under the radar. And, and now with the latest edition, you know, the company I work for decided a couple of years ago it wanted to go into trade books, and I don't know what woke anybody up, but it's like well, Heiser's sitting up there on the fourth floor, you know, he's got this novel. Why don't we ask him if he wants to do this? And at first it was for digital is that's what we do but the special edition will also be available in print probably by the end of this month so that's how the the special edition came about anyway and i remember when you were on art bell that first time like i didn't know you had such a madcap rush to get the book ready <laughs> oh, it was crazy. That, but i remember hearing that art bell appearance crashed your original server to where you'd have sold probably like 20,000 of them that night. Yeah, they were not the print-on-demand outfit that we were using, you know, and granted, it, it was a rush job. They were not ready. You, for instance, people could not find the book by title because they had indexed it with the, the C, with the Sedia, for instance, you know, the uh, that particular stylistic spelling of the C and facade so people couldn't find it. And I didn't have much of a website on my own. I mean, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. But there was a link there, so they if they went that way, they could have found it. But if they were just going to the site and searching for it, they're not going to find it. Then, of course, they have to remember how to spell my last name. There was It was sort of a logistic nightmare, and there were all sorts of problems. And, you know, we, we did have problems with the traffic, and that wasn't the only, you know, time that that happened with Coast to Coast, you know, as is typical. But I don't have the problem now because I know a little bit more about, you know, what I'm doing as far as hosting and I no longer have to call the host the day before the show like I was doing for years and saying, now I'm going to go on this talk show. And at about, <laughs> at about this time of the night, you know, my site will probably just die unless you do something right now to prepare for it. You know, and then to, to convince them that that was real. It was not like somebody trying to sort of uh, talk up their site like they were a big deal. It's just sort of been a circus, you know, in, in, in many respects, because I have a real job. I had a real life. I got I, actually I'm, I'm usually two or three or four people rather than just one. And this was just something thrown into the mix. And so it 
you know, it, it, it was what it was and, you know, you, you do what you can and, you know, you have fun with it. And that was our approach, but it sort of ballooned into this sort of underground kind of phenomenon sort of thing that, you know, we, we didn't expect, uh, I didn't expect at all, but, you know, certainly, you know, haven't, haven't minded that. I mean, I, I enjoy that other, other than the weirdos calling, you know, asking me if I'm an ascended master and stuff like that, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that happens from time to time, but otherwise it's been fun. Did I ever tell you, like, the first time I heard of you or the, the facade, I kind of blew you off? No, no, but I, I was, that would that would be expected. I mean, why why not? The linkage between us, I'm into go when I asked you your publicist, was that Doug Bardell. Okay. Is the way I first heard about the facade or yourself, Joe Jordan and I later laughed about this, because, you know, you get these emails every now and then that kind of come from way out in left field. Sure. But... The way or the connection you and I had that I don't think we've really talked about if we're hanging out personally is that your ex-college roommate, Doug, Mm -hmm. his sister was going to church with my mom in Nashville where (laughs) I used to go to church. Oh, that's crazy. And I get this email, Guy, your mom's church sister, college roommate, has written this really great book, and we've heard you're into the UFO thing out in Roswell, therefore you read this and promote it. I don't remember what I thought exactly, but I was I was kind of skeptical that it actually could be anything cool or of value, and then next thing I know, you're a walk-on superstar in the ufology field, and I'm kind of kicking myself going, darn, I could have known about this months ago if I'd paid more attention or <laughs> responded to that email. Well, that's... Yeah, but that that's really – I would have done the same thing and probably worse. <laughs> well, just wanted to apologize since we've never picked <laughs> that story. <laughs> I'll think about accepting that apology. So, When did you guys first meet? Boy, I, I guess at the first uh, Roswell conference. I think it was – no, it wasn't. It was um, – the first Roswell conference was 2003. Yeah. We met the week after 911 at the Bay Area conference. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Where were we the week after? I mean, what? The San Francisco area, Bay Area UFO conference. Okay. We set up your table and had some alien resistance stuff. Okay. And Doug was with you. Yeah, Doug. You were invited to speak on debunking Zechariah Sitchin yeah. and could Christianity accommodate. That was really funny. I mean, that was probably the first time you'd given that lecture publicly. It was. And at that Bay Area kind of almost new agey crowd. I remember you said before you went and gave the lecture, you gave me all of your books and kind of your contact information in case we didn't see each other again and and instructions on how to get your stuff back to you because you were going to go on and do that talk challenge to Zechariah Sitchin and you were like, my one goal at this conference is to get out of here alive. (laughs) Being well, I, I did get out alive, but they 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 did not pay me. Um, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, they they, they didn't they pay me, and basically made it real clear that I'd never be invited back again, which was okay, <laughs> you know. Aww. What are you gonna do? Great things since then. <laughs> yeah, that was that was quite a trip to get out there after after nine eleven because we had to drive. From Wisconsin to uh, Minneapolis just to get a plane. It was the only plane we could get to San Francisco. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. I kind of went through the same thing. I drove overnight to Albuquerque with the assurance that the planes would be lifting off that morning, and then it turned out they weren't. So I offered, and they allowed me to drive from Albuquerque to Phoenix and pick up a plane later that afternoon, and I Mm. came in that way. But that was crazy because I remember you and I and David Flynn were at a banquet dinner table, and I think Stephen Greer was giving this speech. And you and I, we were all kind of looking at each other with fists clenched, like, you know, I can't believe what I'm hearing. So it was so new age, pro, whatever. And uh, I think that it was out of that dinner, though, where we were like, you know what? We should have our own conference. <laughs> Those yeah. ancients was born. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's correct. I, I do remember that. Yeah, and uh, Mark was there, Mark Flynn as well. So I remember going out to, uh, it was my, my first exposure to sushi as well with those guys. So How'd you like it? It's not something I'd really, you know, hey, let's go out and get some sushi, but it, it's fine. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm not big on sushi either. 
Well, while I got you on the phone, what's going on with the port? And what can you yeah, what's going tell on me about? Well, you know, you know, I, I should say, first of all, everybody wants to know what the word portent means. And basically, it's an ominous warning of things to come is what a portent is. So it's it's definitely something that's coming down the pike and a little bit of a, a sinister tone to it. So that's what the, the title word means. And I think it really does and will typify the content. Uh, what can I say? Uh, have you read the first five chapters of the new of, of the sequel? We haven't. Not unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to re- I'm trying to think of what I can I boy. You're probably better off asking me questions about it, and then I can say yes or no. I can address that. Okay, are Brian and Melissa on the lam in hiding from the secret Kabul government? They are where the facade left them. They're in North Dakota. She, you know, of course... Is pregnant. She is pregnant and, of course, doesn't know how she's pregnant. And, you know, she has a teaching position that uh, Father Benedict arranged uh, at the college. Brian. They're living under pseudonyms, right? Yeah, they're, they they took different last names. And at the end of the facade, you know, there there was a question, how what's the relationship here? But they have decided to pretend to be married. Uh, it just works better with insurance and all that sort of stuff. And it, it both answers questions that they could potentially be asked. But, of course, you know, it might raise a few as well. But they are pretending to be husband and wife, and she's a little better at it than he is. Let's put it that way. <laughs> now, the main character, Brian, is based on you, right? Yeah. He, a he, version. Yeah, he is me. I would say it. he's me by field of expertise, obviously, but he's me sort of when I was in college. That would be where he is at in terms of his emotional state, that sort of thing, you know, his self-image and, and whatnot. So, you know, He's not completely me. He's mostly me in, in that regard. But he's, you know, I've, I've I've grown up since college. But he's where I was, you know, back then. So he would be in his 30s, early 30s, and, and the list would be the same. So they're they're trying to make a go of it in in North Dakota and trying to stay hidden and also trying to make their new identity believable. And at the end of the facade, they're not even really sweethearts yet, are they? See, I always ask people how they would assess their, their relationship at the end of the facade. So I, I would ask both of you what, what you think of that, and then I'll, I'll respond. Where do you think it's, uh, oh, they're close. Yeah, knowing, well, one, knowing how fiction, movies, and television works, it, it's a classic, you can see this one coming relationship for starters. She's mm-hmm. the antagonist. She's against fundamental Christianity, you know, bashing the cults. He is a fundamental Christian. I think what you were trying to say earlier about his character, young, where you used to be, you might even say a little socially awkward. Oh, he's very socially awkward. Okay. Well, I didn't want to. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm being, I'm choosing my word carefully. Well, I'll, 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 let me go even further. He's just socially inept. Okay. Um, and, He's he's very conservative theologically. I mean, he's he's not a fundy like like I would think of them or a lot of people would would think of them. But he's conservative, you know, in, in that regard with his theology. But again, and this is like like me today. I mean, I, I'm theologically conservative, but I have all these really strange ideas on things like the divine council that people look at me like they got two heads. You know, I mean, he he is me. It, it is about the text and nothing else. You know, that's what he's committed to. And, you know, if a group you know doesn't like that, well, that's just unfortunate, but it isn't going to change. Uh, the answers are still going to be the same that I'm, I'm giving you today. So he, he's that, but again, he's, he's very socially backward, you know, and, and she has some real issues, uh, very, you know, really for, you know, what, what we would say, humanly speaking, are good reasons, you know, for her to just hate, hate the church, you know, hate Christianity and things like that. So... You know, they're, they are thrown together. And, of course, there's the pivotal scene in the facade where, you know, she's basically trashed him the whole time. But then he makes the decision to basically save her life at the expense of his own. Yeah. And that that's just a turning point, not only, you know, in, in the story, but it's a turning point for them. It starts them down, you know, the, this road that they're on. But, uh, you know, at the end of the book, you know, he is committed to her. And in pretty much every way. I mean, it's, it's not terribly overt, but you can tell by some of the stuff he does that, you know, this is, he's all in. 
And as a matter of speaking, now he is her hero because of the action you're talking about in the book. Yeah, she... He basically saves her. She's still processing all of this, uh, but, you know... She's not even saved, right? Well, I mean, that's an issue, you know, because she... You know, for for those who haven't read, you know, the the book, one of the, the thing that embittered her in the facade was, you know, she was was raised as a believer in a, in a Christian home, and she goes off to college, and her wonderful Christian boyfriend winds up, you know, taking her to a party, and she gets raped there by this guy, you know, and and some others as well, and and uh, he's not repentant over it. In fact, her parents and the people, you know, back at their church that, that this guy's connected to, you know, really push her to get an abortion, which she does. And from that moment on, I mean, there, there's a, a scene in the port and where she's talking with, with somebody and she just sums it up basically from that point on, it was about revenge. You know, it was about rebellion and, and revenge. And so that was her life. I'm going to do what I want with whoever I want. And if I can ruin some of these Christians along the way, well, that's just great. That's what I'm about. You know, she, all of that is just thrown against the wall when Brian turns out to be what she thought these other men in her life were, but weren't. He's actually the real thing. But she just doesn't, you know, again, she's still trying to process that by the end of the of the facade. And then they get thrown into this situation where they have to escape from the base. They have to make you know, the, these decisions. What are we going to do now? And, of course, he, again, you know, throws away his new life in favor of going with her. And so that's where they wind up. You know, that, that's where they're at. The poor tent, as far as those two and their situation, is about three months after the events of the facade. The poor tent opens happens with some other events that occur at different times in relation to the facade. But the fourth and fifth chapter are contemporary. They begin three months after the events of the facade. So there's one I won't get into it. None of the characters in the chapter are in the first book. But the fifth chapter is the scene with Brian and Melissa. So you essentially, as the reader, you're in the same room with them again. You're there with them in North Dakota, and that's where the book opens, as far as the old characters. But yeah, they've had three months together, and it has changed them both. I have, to, I have to be a little careful here. Yeah, you're always too careful. <laughs> like you use the phrase "sequel turf" whenever I've asked you a question or by email or whatever, yeah. something like that. Like in even ninety seconds or two minutes, can you give us like a synopsis of what this is going to be about? This book, the important. Well, uh, it's the act conflict the issues well this will be more of a of a random listing and mentioning this or that it's not going to i don't know that i can fashion this into anything like a coherent summary here but they're still dealing with their relationship with their feelings for each other that that's going to come to a head in the book there will be some resolution there uh but i i can tell listeners and people who of course who have read the facade that i believe in giving people what they want giving readers what they want but on the other hand a romance is only as good as the obstacles it faces. Mm, and, yeah. and I know how to do that, and I know how to do it with them. That's about all I can say there. That's one issue. He is unemployed. I mean, they right now they have plenty of money because of Father Benedict and Dr. Banster had tried to arrange for them, so they're okay. But he doesn't really know what to do with himself because he can't go back, you know, to his old life. So he, at the end of the facade, you know, Benedict had encouraged him to put stuff out on the Internet about what he thinks, you know, what not specifics about what he's seen, because that would give away who the author is, you know, of the material. He can't get into too many specifics. Like, he can't say, hey, I spent the, I spent the summer at Area 51. And right. <laughs> he, he, so does he become an anonymous blogger type yeah, internet yes. guy? Yeah, and, he, and he's, he's very good at it. He never posts from the same location twice. He never uses the same upload service. He never uses the same FTP client. Uh, he, he moves around. There is no discernible pattern to where these posts are coming from, when they come, and all this sort of stuff. But it's attracting attention that, that he doesn't know about. Their identities are not known. Their location is not known. But this is the only thing he can think of to do at this point, to sort of get this out, like, hey, I, I think this UFO stuff is a deception. Here's why. He's trying to articulate. He's also trying to sort out what he thinks about it. And the portent turn, there, there's something that happens in the facade related to, you know, some of the other characters and, and a murder that occurred 
that I dropped a few things in the facade that I'm picking up now to basically turn the storyline toward how does all this stuff fit in what's happening in the wider culture, sort of the times in which we live, the cultural shifts that are happening, you know, really the drift into a post-Christian world. And I think even in our own country, the trending toward less democracy, less liberty, more totalitarian thinking, just sort of the geopolitical issues that are out there. Where does this fit? That's one issue that the storyline is going to get into. Another one is what's the meaning of of all the, the UFO alien stuff? And so this is the portent is my opportunity as the author, as Mike, to sort of lay out what I think it all means. I put it this way to someone else that I did an interview with. This book gives me the chance to pretend that I am the intelligent evil mind behind all of this. What am I trying to accomplish? What are my goals? What are my strategies toward accomplishing those goals? I think one of the mistakes that Christian researchers make in this area is that they think there is one agenda. There isn't one agenda. There are many agendas because there are many different kinds of people. There are yeah. there are a range of goals that have to be accomplished. There is no silver bullet, as it were, to getting this task done. So I get to imagine myself, again, as the intelligent evil mind. How would I pull this off? Okay, again, given clear goals... How would I do it? And the goals are pretty simple. The goals are how to prevent people from coming to Christ. That's actually easy. The other issue is how do I crush the spirit of the church? How do I get people to turn their loyalty against Yahweh and against Christ? How do I get them to serve another God? How do I get them to abandon their faith? How do I get them to fall into the baskets that the book of Hebrews describes? where they either turn from the faith or they think they're still in the faith, but they're actually not. What strategies would I use to convince Christians that I'm okay, I'm still following Jesus, I'm still in the faith, but they're making certain decisions because they're forced to. And I can't say too many things in terms of specifics. They're forced to make decisions about what they believe that will appear to be in the faith, but they are not. They don't realize what they're surrendering until they're on the back end of it, and they may never realize it. The way I approach this whole thing, again, I'm an academic. I can't divorce myself from it. I'm not going to write anything that's cartoonish, okay? Angels are not going to come in and writing on the head of a pen and say of the day. Uh, I want to make the storyline something that people could read and go, you know, I can see this happening. I can see that this could happen. This really could happen. And all of this to me is about controlling the vocabulary, He who controls the vocabulary will win the day, okay? And I'm talking about things like, what is theism? Who is God? What what do we mean really by resurrection? What is the nature of, of Christ in the New Testament? There are all these things that Christians assume are nailed down. And I'm not saying they're not nailed down, but what I am saying is that there are all sorts of ways that in academia especially, that scholars play with the text and they play with the vocabulary because they're angling towards certain things. Again, it's about controlling vocabulary. It's about making people believe they must make certain decisions to preserve their faith, to do the right thing. Again, if I were intelligent evil, I would capitalize on the theological and biblical illiteracy of the church. Uh, And I know how to do that because I'm on the inside of this in terms of of academics. I've joked probably with you a couple of times about, look, I'm like Batman, okay? I'm using my powers for good and not evil, you know? Okay. Agreed. Again, this book will allow me, again, to ask myself the question, okay, what are my goals and how would I do it? How would I do it? And how would I make it something that only a few people who are really paying attention would know what's going on around them and would know that to make this decision over here, you can't do that because you're going to, you'll end up denying the faith if you do that. It's going to look like the faith, but it isn't really the faith. You know, again, there, and there is no one trajectory. There is no one agenda. Uh, if my goals are those two simple things, there are many things I need to think about as the intelligent evil to get people to do the things I want, to get them to think the way I want them to think. 
to put them in, in an emotional or theological or spiritual intellectual crisis to get them to move somewhere. So I, I, I actually do think, again, that I'm not just making this up in fiction, but I actually do think that what we call ufology, UFO stuff, it's a multifaceted thing. There are people that you and I both know, guys, that have different reasons for being interested in, in all this. Again, there's a whole spectrum here. So, you know, they would all answer the question, well, what does it mean differently? I think that one of those groups, uh, there is a group within the what we would call the military industrial complex that is deliberately using this to advance a, you know, for lack of a better word, a, a fascist worldview. And there are ways that you could use this to move people into that bottleneck or to embrace the idea. You know, you either heard them there or they come running. Okay, that's one perspective. But I also think there's a greater, again, a, a non-human intelligence about this, a non-human intelligent evil that is also going to use this to create, again, these situations where people must make decisions, where they're duped into, again, surrendering the faith and abandoning the faith, and they don't even realize it. So those are sort of the two trajectories that I'm going to lay on most when it comes to what happens with Brian and others that he meets. And, you know, some of the characters from the facade will, of course, be in the poor tenants, not just Brian and Melissa. You've got us, but, both of us, over here mouthing the word, wow, wow. We have some really not good to, themes. Try not to interrupt <laughs> you. <laughs> Very good well, I, I want this to be like the facade in that this is not just your light, fluffy, run-of-the-mill sort of piece of fiction. I, I want it to be something that, again, for the Christian, somebody who assumes that, yeah, there is this thing called the, the spiritual world out there. That's real. It, it operates. But there's also, you know, bad people out there, and they have their own agendas. I mean, it, all these things that we sort of say we, you know, we take for granted, but, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into anybody else's book. But then they write just this cartoonish kind of stuff. <laughs> I, I just think it's better. I, I think it's more effective to hopefully get your readers to just look at what's there because this is going to be just like the facade. Every technology I mentioned, every government document, every meeting, every this and that, it, it is all going to be real. It's all real. The only thing that, that's fiction is, is, again, the way I connect the dots and you know the the, the storyline that I derive from those things. But I want people to read this and go, you know, if this really did happen, I can see Christians reacting this way. I can see this happening. I can see this domino effect. I can see people thinking this because of that. And I can see the culture shifting and this having really worldview level impact if some of these things, you know, were in place and were in operation. Uh, and again, some of the things that I'll do here, I think actually are in operation. Having said all of that, I know by the end of the facade that people had certain expectations about, you know, well, I know what's going to happen with this now. I know where he's going with that. My word of caution is mm -hmm. don't assume anything. You don't assume anything. Always good advice. <laughs> That's the sense I always got from reading the facade is you cannot guess where this is going or where he's going with this. I'll attest to that. And now you're even... I can be annoying to go to a movie with, for example, or watch a TV show because I can see formulas unfolding. Mm -hmm. And half the time I'm watching a movie or a TV show, I can kind of mouth out the next line before it comes. And the facade kind of stymied me in that way. One of the uh, points near the end of the facade, the evil character, you were saying how evil would use worldviews, etc. I found myself kind of astounded, like jaw dropping open. You made it plain that the evil entity was letting Brian go because he was going to somehow use him Right. within the church to push the agenda, right? You're, right? you're useful. You're a useful idiot <laughs> yeah. or useful theologian. Is, is that continued in there? Are you going to open that up? Now, the, the reader knows things, of course, that Brian does not by the end of the facade. Obviously, Brian did not see that conversation. He did not hear that conversation and see what went on in the room for that. But the reader, of course, knows that in some way that Brian and Melissa being off the base is in some way useful to the evil entity, the, the watcher, uh, is in some way useful to him. So you don't really know exactly how, but you just know that he's actually counting on Brian doing what he thinks is right. And Brian's going to do what he thinks is right. But all of that, again, will essentially be a piece in a larger mosaic, a larger you know, puzzle. 
that will get used by intelligent evil to further a particular end. Again, this is Brian is in a mismatched chess match, okay, and, mm. and he's not privy to a lot of these things. But again, we know as believers that yeah, that's a mismatched chess match. But the Watchers are in mi- a mismatched chess match too. They are outgunned as well, whether they want to admit it or not. And again, the portent will also give me the opportunity to, to play with you know a few theological things. I mean, eschatology is going to be part of this. And you know, for your listeners that don't know, I I really don't like eschatology. I don't like any of the systems. I think they all cheat. But I'm I'm going to be dealing with eschatological stuff uh, again in a certain way that again will be useful. <laughs> <laughs> will be useful for the enemy again but so the the enemy has brian overmatched but the enemy himself is overmatched so how does that work what does that look like i mean who, who, it's a cat and mouse game but who is the cat and who is the mouse and you know you, you have all of this going on and again brian isn't consciously aware uh, of it now one of the decisions i have to make in the portent is is he going to become more aware of it and if so if i decide to go that direction how and how much you know, where I already have an inkling that it's going to require a third book, but I'm, I'm not going to commit to that. But that's just sort of an inkling I have now. But I'll, I'll know by the time I'm done with this one if that's true or not. But I just have this, this sneaking suspicion that you know, I, I may not be able to, to pull this off just in one one more. So Trilogies are big these days. Yeah, they're, they're big these days. <laughs> Right. Uh, let me give you an example. Again, I, I, I'm not saying I'm going to do anything specifically with this in the portent, but it's on the table. It's in my, my brainstorm list of notes, which are, is, is quite vast at this point. We assume, we assume that a fallen divine being cannot change. And we also assume that an unfallen divine being can no longer become corrupt. Why do we assume that? Is there some verse that says that? Traditions? Nope. There is nothing that says that. That is an assumption. It is a pure assumption. I agree. And usually the talk of it is, well, there was this rebellion way back when in the third of the eight. Hey, there is, <laughs> there is no passage that describes a pre-creation or even pre-Genesis 6, pre-anything. There's no verse that actually talks about an antediluvian or ancient rebellion of divine beings that yeah. that language comes from revelation 12 right if, and if you go to revelation 12 it's obviously not in great antiquity it's either connected you know to the the birth of christ or again events associated with the first coming or or you know perhaps you know you, you might depending on your eschatology you might want to move it forward but it has nothing to do with the past wow yeah. thank so you we that. agree we've been agree. saying that forever <laughs> where do we get this stuff and again, I, I don't have, I, I can't say anything specific, you know, right now, but it's just stuff like this that is just grist for the mill. I mean, it, it's right there, sitting there, that again, may or may, or may not in, in the course of as the thing develops, because I don't have the whole thing outlined. It, it's more or less just coming to me, you know, as I know what I want to cover, I know what ideas I want to cover, and then it just becomes a, a question of, okay, how do, how do we get there? Um, so that may or may not, you know, become useful at some point. But it's just a, a typical example of like every Christian would answer this question the same way. But there isn't actually any any basis for it, at least in terms of, of the text. So why do we think that? Wouldn't that be interesting, you know, if I mean, you could go different directions with that or, or whatever. And if it's useful, then I'll, I'll entertain it. But if it's not, then I'm not going to worry about it. But there are just lots of things like that, that for the sake of what I'm doing in this, that will be territory that I sort of survey and you know, have to make decisions on what, what do I want to get into, you know, theologically, and that, that sort of thing. If we can allow a sort of a seg, the topics that you were talking about, the modern culture and possibly how intelligent evil is using it. I mean, I just want to say, when I was reading the facade as a Christian activist in this field, I felt like you'd kicked me in the gut at the end of it when the evil entity was so playing and using Brian to be a Christian activist in the UFO field, you know, as an unwitting pawn. But thank you for what you said earlier about really the evil entities are outmatched. That's actually comforting your 
you're a lot more pastoral than you generally let on, by the way. But <laughs> You have said that before, and I, I have thought about that from time to time in terms of wondering, like... Vocation? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not vocation. I know I'm not suited for that. I don't struggle with that at all. Um, I know myself well enough to know that. But, you know, I, it, it was a good reminder, you know, to, to try to be that way, especially, you know, when you're... You know, when you're talking to people or doing Q&A and stuff like that. So that was good to hear. Um, but you, you talk about getting a kick in the gut at the end there. And this whole who's playing who, you know, kind of thing. You know, r- right there, it, again, you get into another one. The old question of, you know, the demons, if, you know, the Satan knows that he, he can't win, what in the world are they doing all this for? Do they really believe that? If yeah. if the answer is yes, then that question is, is certainly legitimate, and you know there have been efforts to answer that. But maybe they don't believe it. You know, maybe they really think that they can really either get away with this, or you know what, we have a pretty good record up to this point. I mean, the world the world's a whole lot worse than what you know this God of the Bible wants it. You know, we, we seem to be kicking his butt every day with all these idiots down here. You know, you, you could almost look at it where they could think that you know we're not doing so bad. You know, we're we're working our our program. Uh, against what you know Yahweh wants and you know we're not doing too bad we're still here he hasn't gotten rid of us and there's probably more people that don't believe in him than do you know we're not doing too bad so you know we might want to feel encouraged you know let's let's sing our demonic kumbaya to each other and you know get back with the program here and really think that they can work it I mean again it's just an area of theological inquiry that might be useful. Do they really think that they could get away with this? I think that they probably have some idea of how much they're going to get away with. But they know they have a limited time, and so they're just trying to bring as many people down with them as they can. I mean, winning the smaller battles, knowing they already have lost the war. See, I would I would answer it in that way and add this. It depends. Your, it's going to sound dumb. Your definition of victory depends on how you define it. You know, it, we we also assume that for them to be thinking about winning, that it's an all or nothing proposition. Well, maybe it's not to them. Again, yeah, maybe it is about doing as much damage as can possibly be done. Uh, maybe it's about, and I, I can't remember if I have this line in the facade or not. Maybe the goal is not to beat Yahweh. Maybe they know he's superior. We will never do away with him. But what we can do is make him childless. To as much as possible, we can take away the thing that he loves. Maybe that's our goal. You know, we can't get rid of him, but we can get rid of the thing he loves. We can turn that against him. It, you know, maybe that's the best way to articulate what the goals might be. But again, it, the portent, you know, again affords me the opportunity to put myself in that position and play with it. You know, think about it again. If if this were me, what are my goals? Where do I want to go, and how do I get there? And I'm very patient. (laughs) I'm exceedingly patient. Um, This is getting a little close to maybe saying too much, but I'm going to try to dance around it. Maybe this whole thing about we know how much time we have. Well, how would they know that? Again, if, if Jesus doesn't know the day or hour, how would they know it? And maybe if they think they have an inkling of God's quote unquote prophetic timetable, maybe it has something to do with, you know, the signs in the sky and celestial signs and all this sort of thing. You know, to guess that right, you have to make certain decisions on certain things said in the text. Maybe they guessed wrong. Maybe they guessed right. Who's the one guessing right and wrong? Are the Christians the ones that are guessing right, or is, is intelligent evil? Maybe they have it reversed. Maybe they're each following their own timeline, and one of them is the correct one, and the other one's not. But, you know, again, we, we wouldn't really think. We would assume that we have the correct one, and they don't. Maybe it's the other way around. And what would that look like? Because then you have this sense of urgency on both sides, this sense of, you know, we, we know what's happening, and we know that this and that's approaching, and all but they're doing it for entirely different reasons and they're pursuing different timelines. You know, that would, I'll, I'll say this, that would certainly be useful, uh, you know, in, in a storyline, especially, you know, when you get into situations where it looks like you've gained a victory or it looks like you've suffered a defeat. Well, maybe you haven't, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, because it just depends on getting certain things right and you're making guesses. We have to guess, they have to guess. And there's this sense that we need to make guesses, 
but we don't know that we're guessing correctly. And for intelligent evil, again, how does that affect the, their plans? How does that affect the agenda? How does that you know motivate them? How does how does that enter into their planning? All that sort of thing. So there's all, there's a number of ways again that that you can go with with some of these important ideas that a lot of Christians out there, you know, really sort of like, you know, I know what's going to happen in the end times. You know, I, sure, this is the Bible. You just have to open up the Bible and read it. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, let's, let, let's just play with that for a while. Well, I don't know. The enemy is old, and the Bible says he has a lot of wisdom. I think when it comes to the devil quoting scripture, if the answers are in there, that uh, intelligent evil might be able to have a better idea of the timetable out of the word than what we might easily have. Um, maybe, they some... maybe the answers aren't in there. Oh, it, I think they are. Example, example. Paul's comment that all Israel will be saved. What does he mean? Does he mean national political Israel? Does he mean geographical Israel? Is he defining Israel as believers, the new Israel, which are both Jew and Gentile? The short answer is, we don't know. And depending on, on which one of those options you pick, that will dictate your eschatology. Yeah. Oh, prophecy is puzzles. So how it's meant involves a more detailed study. Well, did the would anyone have thought Okay, my, to me, the, the best passage for this is Amos 9. And I, I'm almost willing to say this will show up in the book. Uh, Amos 9, 10 through 12, it's the prophecy about the tabernacle of David being rebuilt. I mean, there's three verbs that are rebuilt, like built again, and so on and so forth. So that the remnant of Edom, you know, might be, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact terminology. The, the focus there is the remnant of Edom. What's the verse? 9, 10 through 12. Yeah, Amos 9, 10 through 12. Go ahead and just go ahead and read that out loud for your uh, for the, the audience. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. That they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Is that it? Yep. Yeah. Now, what would you expect the outcome of that prophecy to be? If you were a disciple, you're sitting there in first century, first century Judah, first century Jerusalem, and you go to synagogue one day, and that's the passage. What do you think? I, I can't give a really thought out answer on the fly of this. I haven't studied it much. Well, you don't. You don't have to. Just what do you think? What's okay. your, your first sort of impulse? Let me see the passage. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Hold on. I'm gonna step away and read it. What's your first impulse when you read Amos 9, 10 through 12, rebuilding the tent of David that's fallen and all this kind of stuff? What is that describing? What's going to happen? How does that come true? What, what do you think, I? I feel like we've got a pop quiz going right now. It's not a quiz. I, I, I can almost say no matter what you say, I'm going to pull the rug out from my <laughs> David's kingdom will be restored and his people will be saved. If I kind of need to read the rest of Amos right. going back <laughs> to get the context here to really give a good answer, so I'm not really willing to comment. When it says I, We're not in the middle at the time. I will rebuild its ruins, what does that sound like? Something that got destroyed okay. is going to be rebuilt, i.e. the temple, okay. the nation. Okay. Anything else? It seems to be about the millennial reign, I would think. Okay, that, that's certainly going to be into the conversation. Anybody who I would ask about this, you know, would, would have all of those expectations. Because when you, when you see something like a word like tabernacle of David or the tent of David, you're thinking, you know, about temple. Okay, you're thinking about a structure because of the verbs of rebuilding and it's fallen and it's in ruins and it needs to be restored and all that kind of stuff. It gives you the impression that something physical has been destroyed and will get fixed or rebuilt, right? I mean, just that on a very simple level. Especially in the context you provided of a first century Jewish Christian. Right, right. And then the, the, all the, the, second away. Part, the second part, so that they would, you know, possess the remnant of Edom. Okay, so when you see Edom, you're thinking about Edom, right? The Edomites, mm -hmm. okay? Do you know where this passage is quoted in the New Testament? No, we don't. We plunked the pop quiz. Yeah. We have it's quoted. It. Go to Acts 15. Okay. For those that don't know, Mike used to uh, teach 
college level theology university classes. He he does this for fun to people. <laughs> Okay, here's here's the point. You read Amos nine, and you know again we've been trained to this literal expectation of prophecy, and literal meaning sort of this one to one correspondence. What's described in the old is going to come true in sort of a corresponding way that we would mentally expect, because again we're we're reading these words in the Old Testament and we're assigning meaning to them. We're thinking about a tabernacle. We're thinking about something in ruins. We're thinking about it being rebuilt and. So we have the expectation, of maybe this is the temple, maybe this is the millennium, and all this kind of stuff. It's none of that in Acts 15. And in fact, Luke, who writes Acts, and of course James is the speaker, even changes a word. Okay, This is the Jerusalem Council, and Paul is explaining about the salvation of the Gentiles to the group. Like, man, this is a wonderful thing. I'm out there, and I'm preaching all these Gentiles, and they're becoming believers in Jesus. And in verse 12 says in Acts 15, all the assembly fell silent. <laughs> And then he listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. Again, probably a reference back to Simon Peter, who in Acts 10 and 11 had his you know, famous vision about the Gentile inclusion and all that stuff. Goes to Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Verse 15, and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. And now he quotes Amos 9. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of not Edom, mankind, may seek the Lord. In Amos 9, it was Edom, you know, being sought or being obtained. And here it's reversed. And we don't have Edom, we have mankind, that mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from of old. Somehow, Luke and James, the speaker, of course, takes Amos 9 and they make it about the church. They make it about Jew and Gentile being one people of God. It has nothing to do with a physical building, a structure, anything like that. Somehow, they look at that Old Testament passage, and they get something abstract like the church out of it. And not only that, but he's quoting the Septuagint, which changes the word Edom. It's the same three consonants in Hebrew, Aleph, Dalet, Mem. It's pointed Edom for Edom. But the Septuagint translated it with the Greek word for mankind, and they were reading Adam, same consonants, different vowels. So the Septuagint version gets quoted here under inspiration to specifically make the point that that Amos 9 passage was about the church, nothing physical. Okay, it's, it's about people. It's about Gentile inclusion. Now, here's the point. That flies in the face of the approach to prophecy that most Christians are sort of just taught and, and almost have intuitively is this literal interpretation of prophecy. And I got news for you. This is not the only passage that does this. Okay. What the New Testament writers do with the old sometimes just makes your head spin. You know, you'd get an F in hermeneutics. You're not following the grammatical historical method of exegesis, Dr. Luke. I'm going to have to fail you from hermeneutics class. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but I have the spirit and you don't. <laughs> I get what you're saying. Here, and here, here, but I'm angling toward, toward this point. There are so many people that are so convinced of so many things about prophecy and the biblical interpretation of prophecy. And they're convinced because, again, they're just sort of trained for the words I see over here. I'm going to kind of look for those same words over here in the New Testament or yet future. And my question is very simply, how can you make that assumption? There's a reason why the disciples were walking around with Jesus for three and a half years, and he's given them scripture, and they're looking at him like he's got two heads. They just don't get it. They don't understand a lot of what is written in the Old Testament prophetically until after the fact. Till after they've been with Jesus, he's died, he's risen again, you know, he has his little speech there before he ascends, and then, you know, the Spirit, again, showing, opening their eyes, showing them things. We don't have that. I mean, we, we, do, we don't have hindsight for the prophecy that remains that we think we have figured out. I don't think we're any better than the disciples. I think that when it's all said and done, you know, whenever this all this plays out and we're looking back on it, we're going to look at it and go, holy cow, how in the world could we have known 
that this statement here, this time in the New Testament, would have played out this way. There's just no way we could have seen that. I think the same thing's going to happen in our future that happened with the disciples. You know, some of it you can look at and, okay, I understand how you get from point A to point B there. But other times you look at it and you go, what were they thinking? And here it's under inspiration. This is what the Spirit is thinking. This isn't what you're thinking. This is what God's thinking. This is what God has in mind. And what God has in mind and what we assume are not necessarily going to jive, you know, for obvious reasons. I think for the most part you're right. And looking at this and Acts and Amos, having meant to look at it, it does seem like there was a more spiritual fulfillment of it. But that doesn't preclude that there could be a more literal one later and that it's kind of going to have a dual fulfillment where one's spiritual and one is more physical. Right. The idea of dual fulfillment is a hope. It's a guess. It's an assumption. Why? Because, well, you know, we can kind of see that happening one or two other places. So yeah, maybe it'll happen here. Right. And the, the, the operative word there is maybe. Well, I mean, it has been seen, I would think, in other places. Like in Acts, whenever he's talking about in the last days, my spirit will be poured out on all flesh. You know, that happened then with the last days with maybe one meaning and literally happened. But then you just look at more of the charismatics here just in the last hundred years. You could say, well, it seems to be happening again in the last days in a different way. So, I mean, I, I can see dual and cyclic fulfillments. Oh, it happens. You know, things in prophecy. It, it, it does happen. But here's the point. You don't know where it's going to happen. There's no way to pick where it's supposed to happen and where it isn't. And you only know these things by hindsight. Yeah. And so anyone who wants to, you know, it's like I said at Future Congress, you know, which is, I don't know if I'll ever get invited to do that again. If somebody comes up to you and, and says, you know, we have this pretty much figured out. We know what's going to happen. We know what, what this is going to look like. Here's the timetable. Here's this, that, the other thing. Here's the chronology. Here's this event after that. We got all this figured out. I said, just, just tune them out. Tune them out. Okay, because un unless they're showing you stuff like this, and I went through this passage in a session, and it's like people have never seen it before. And you know why people have never seen it? I, I know why. I, I know why I never saw it for years and years and years. Because I'm not looking up the Old Testament citations. Okay, I'm not, I'm not really checking. I'm assuming that when the New Testament writer quotes something, that you're just going word for word, and there's this one-to-one -one correspondent literal match. I never look. Okay, the New Testament does some really unusual things with the Old Testament. Uh, there is no one way that a New Testament writer uses the Old Testament. There's four or five ways. Sometimes fulfillment is just simply by analogy. And there's only one point of analogy really to be made, and the other points of the prophecy just drop off. Now, we assume, well, maybe they're still hanging out there. You know, maybe they're still hanging out there for maybe, but how would we know? We didn't get the first one, you know, unless we had hindsight. Uh, th again, this is why when I when I look at eschatology, I just I just sort of shake my head, you know, and try not to roll my eyes because I'm thinking, look, this is so complicated and it, it's so dependent on hindsight. Even if you were living right there after Jesus rose, I mean, that's the only time you're you're thinking back, you're looking back, and I, and you got to live with him for three and a half years, and now you're you're able to filter the events that you saw and and what he taught you about what they meant, and it's coming back to you. Now it's starting to make sense. Now I'm going to go reread my Old Testament, and you know I, I can see where where what the Master said about this passage okay i i can kind of see it now because of the way he died or because of what he did or because of where he was when he said this that or the other i can sort of get it now they didn't have any roadmap they didn't have any of that and and we don't have any of that because we're we're living in this moment where we've got stuff sort of still out there and we're sitting here trying to figure it out and, and all i'm saying is look you mean anybody that says they've got this figured out just tune them out because they don't. Okay, they're, they're just they're not going to be able to do this because I think the most reasonable expectation is that if prophecy didn't work this neatly the first time, it ain't going to work this neatly now. Uh, we are we are no in no better position, you know, without you know being able to, again to see what what's in God's head as opposed to the, our best efforts, you know, to, to understand these things. So. There are any number of things in prophecy that are just, I think, this is my own personal take, I think a lot of prophecy is deliberately ambiguous. 
uh, yeah. because again, like with the first coming, the, the whole first time, I think we, I mentioned this when we were in Nashville, this whole sense of, hey, look, if the, the, the powers, the demonic powers had known, you know, what the result of the crucifixion would be, they would have never done it. Even something, even something that central to theology, the, the idea that Messiah is going to become incarnate, has to suffer and die and blah, 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 blah. Even you know, Paul says, if, if they had known what, what the fallout would be, that it, it, it essentially is the catalyst event to their ruin and to God's plan, they would have never done this. You know, it, so I think prophecy is just sort of, that's just the way it is. Well, I think it's riddles and puzzles, and I agree it is meant to be ambiguous, and I would agree that hindsight is one of the best ways we learn how the writings actually apply into reality when it comes to fulfillment. But, you know, I do think that also, like, look at John the Baptist. I mean, he was aware of what was going on. There was at least one exception that kind of got this was the time, and your the Lord is... John how much did John know? He did know something. There still are prophets. I mean, I, I can agree that, yeah, I think for the most part, we're going to be looking backwards and be like, oh, that's what that meant, you know, about the fulfillment later. But there are exceptions, too. Well, I, I wouldn't say we can't know anything. I'm saying we can't know a lot. And that, for the most part, we're guessing. And One of your points earlier was that both the Christian church and intelligent evil are guessing. I think they're both guessing. We have our agendas, our timetables, our beliefs, and we are acting upon them, and we have a worldview built around them, and you're just like you have been as long as I've known you. Mike Kaiser is still asking, could Christianity accept a genuine Bible prophecy? <laughs> well, right. <laughs> I ask I ask lots of questions that, that kept me into trouble. Um, but again, my, going back to Nicole's thought, you know, I do think that again, intelligent evil has some sense that look, whether we like to admit it or not, we are not ontologically on par with Yahweh. We we know that we hate him, but we know it. But having said that, you know, we we know that he has let humanity be what it is. I mean, there there is genuine free will. There's all this kind of stuff. The whole all the imaging theology is important here, and all this kind of stuff that I do. We know that that he he has chosen to allow humans as his imagers and us as his imagers. He's given us freedom. Now Yahweh claims that he has ordained the ends and he will steer all things to the, his desired end. Mm -hmm. uh, we may or may not believe that. Okay, we, we know he's bigger than us, but you know what? Let's play the game. Let's get into the game and we're going to work our plan and we're going to work it under the assumption that we, that we only have a certain amount of time. We're going to work our plan and we're going to try to figure out what he's up to, what's in his mind, what he, what his goals are, what his timetable. We're going to try to figure that out. But in the meantime, we're going to work our own plan. And our own plan, again, is going back to some of these themes. And, and then you go to the human side and humans are trying, believers anyway, are trying to, to take a look and trying to figure out what is in God's mind as well. What, what's the timetable? What's going on? The disadvantage to a lot of humans is that they don't believe that the supernatural world is thinking about anything, mm. okay? Because, well, you know, these, these demons, they're just like sitting there licking their wounds if they're even real. You know, we, we have to accept God and Jesus because otherwise, what, what the heck are we doing here anyway? You know, but this whole supernatural world that's interacting with humanity and that has intelligence and there's hierarchy and there's dominion, uh, you know, I don't know if we can believe any of that. So, I mean... There's just a lot of the church that just that's just dumb as a box of rocks. I mean, it just you know they're not thinking about anything. They're not can't think about anything, and and they are just they are just low hanging fruit. Well, okay. it's, a, it's a body of many parts, you know. So on the other side, there's people that by God's grace get to help with teaching them and they're, leading them into truth. You are. know, and, and and the dumb ones maybe doing the heavy lifting and giving the money that funds. Well, I mean. Stuff. Yeah, God. God typically works in in very small scale ways too. That that I think I think this is going to sound dumb, but my impression is that God doesn't mind operating under the radar. Mm. You know, in all sorts of it, quote unquote invisible ways. But the the real lament I feel, you know, for the church, I think the church is filled with a lot of bright people that are capable of thinking well uh, about a lot of things, but they're either they're either never confronted with the need to think well about certain things and they're never given they're never given enough content so that they can sort of begin that process 
or they don't care. I mean, you, you got you got three different groups there. You know, we can speculate about which group's bigger and smaller and all that kind of stuff. But there there are very few people, you know, with, within the church that. I mean, really, really, you know, put what push comes to shove, that acquiring biblical knowledge and thinking theologically, that it's not a, a terribly high priority you know, for them. I mean, there, we, all of us, we know exceptions to this. But on the one hand, you know, people are they're out living their lives, and, and that's understandable. They have worries. They have concerns. We all have those things. But, you know, I, my frustration is I, I look around and I, I, I see people either believers not going to church, you know, again, we can talk about whether there are good or bad reasons for that, or not being engaged, and all this sort of thing. And then, you know, the, the church becomes about the music, or about the fellowship, or about something else. And I'm thinking, look, there are 168 hours in a week. Can't we just devote one, just one, to content? Can we devote one hour a week to stretching our minds? When it comes to biblical content, is that too much to ask? So this is why I couldn't be a pastor, because I could see myself standing in front of a congregation Sunday morning and saying that and insulting a lot of people. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, literally just saying things like, look, there are lots of churches here in, in town or nearby. If you can't tolerate content, you just need to go to one of the other ones. You must have a tolerance for content to be happy here. I like you. I'm sure you're a good guy. I'm sure you're a wonderful mom, whatever. But if you can't tolerate content, I'm just telling you, go somewhere else. You'll be happier. You know, <laughs> There's still a ton of people. You've met them. You've dialogued with them that have either read your book or watched DVDs and stuff over the years that would love to go to a church that you were pastoring who actually could accept those terms. Yeah, yeah. I don't. They let. They'd be happy to watch a bunch of people go somewhere else so that they could get down to business and study and stuff I like know. that. I, I know. I'm. I meet these lurkers everywhere, and <laughs> and I not in church, right? <laughs> well, no, in and out. You know, it. You know, I. I don't know what to say to them. You know, I. I <laughs> It um, it's disturbing. I mean, it, it, it I, I feel for them, and I and I'm just concerned that 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 the church is just really vulnerable when it comes to the world of ideas. You know, being able to really think theologically, not not just within the Bible, but but really as as things you know external to our faith. You know, would would sort of impinge upon our worldview that people are able to think well uh, when it comes to that. And so, again, since my head is in this now, again in in the sequel, and this these are the kinds of thoughts I'm thinking. It's disturbing because, again, he who controls the vocabulary has a significant advantage uh, when there's not enough on the other side that can can really take what's being said head on and saying, no, this is not the case. This is not the truth. I know exactly what you're doing with the words you're using, and I'm going to tear it apart in front of in front of this this audience here. I'm going to show them what you are doing. You know, I, I think, you know, again, just outside of the fiction, I think we're just going to see more and more come down the pike that are really serious, cutting edge sorts of things that are going to force believers to, I hate to put it this way, but to really assess whether they believe any of this or not. And again, that, that those are the kinds of things I want to hit on in the portent because I am concerned that the church is weak. But I console myself by, by saying, look, you know, I can I can show you passages in Irenaeus where Irenaeus is complaining about people spending too much time in shopping and not you know, not being interested in scripture and things like this. And, 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 no, literally he did, you know, and the church has somehow made it for another 2000 years. You know, um, <laughs> I think remnant theology is really important. Uh, it, it is biblical theology that, that God will step in as it were, if he needs to and raise up a remnant, uh, he will win in the end. Things will move toward the end that he has, has decreed and that, he doesn't need to impinge on free will uh, to get it there, but but he will not let it die. And you know, again, the, these are the, the sorts of things that you know console me when I'm sitting there at one in the morning looking at at my notes, going, "This is just awful." <laughs> oh. I'm depressed. You know? <laughs> he foreknew before he made anything what would happen. You know. I, I I tend to I tend to back end sovereignty, and I, but I do think God knows all things real and possible. Um, so yeah, he he does know. 
you know, it, it uh, you know, again, to sort of make it a negative thought here as well, I'm thinking, you know, if I can think of something like this, that looks like it would really damage the church a lot. If I can think of this, you know, it, imagine what the real forces of you know, are thinking. You know, it's like I don't think they're sitting here waiting for me to type it out in Microsoft Word. I think they got this down and even better. Um, you know, but I go back and forth. You know, so I, I almost feel like I am playing the part a little bit of, of Brian, even though I know more than he does, because you know, he, there's a lot that he doesn't know. Mm-hmm. Again, that the reader knows, but you know, I, I sort of feel feel myself caught in that. But, and again, one of the questions in the book is, how much like me do I make Brian? You know, in other words, how much does he really begin to understand? And who would, how would he learn it? And what would the per, what would the point be? And what would the effect be? You know, I I could see the the colonel or the watcher just sitting him down and saying, I'm going to tell you what I'm up to. Just so that you can despair, just so, mm. just, so, just so that you can know, and I'm going to let you alive so you can watch. Okay, I I can see that. <laughs> I, th- I would think Ryan's faith would counteract that, wouldn't it? Well, you see again as the reader you know, and, and as the writer, you know, I I have to ask myself questions like, okay, if I if I go that direction. You know, here's where the pastoral element, you know, comes in. I I can't leave people without hope here. I mean, I because I I've, I've got this character and they're in that room and you know you're right, Nicole. Brian is going to defy him, and it it may sound hollow, it may sound silly because he's overmatched. But but he needs to say something that the reader can can take away and go, you know what? He's right. You know, he this is going to be awful and it's going to work. But what Brian said to come back to him is right. You know, he is he was on target there, and it, it's something that I need to keep in mind. You know what I mean? You, that yeah. that makes writing the fiction really hard because yeah. it, there's so much messaging and and trying to anticipate response. You know, when you do it again, if I was doing you know Buffy and Jody get married before the rapture, I mean I could crank out five of those in a year, you know, and and just want to die after each one. But, but this is this is just there's just a lot more going on here um, than that, and I intend you know for it to be that way. I want it to be that way because uh, I I don't I don't know how else I could communicate a, a lot of things that I think about other than by virtue of a story. So I can see leaving the readers with hope that Brian would come back. That and you're saying oh. it's fiction, but yet it is based in reality, and the reality is that God wins. Yeah. So, See, and, and there, there's the tricky part too, because if if I do and and I do want it to be realistic, that somebody could read this and go, you know, I could see where people, I could see where the culture, I could see where the church could start thinking this, that, or the other thing, mm-hmm. and, I, and, I, and I can see what the impact would be. If I do that well, I I don't want to leave the audience in despair. <laughs> I don't. Well, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it so well, and then just and then, well, you know, the end. You know, there we go. And you know, I I do have a, a sense of people need to have have hope. They, you know, evil is not going to win, even as as bad as it looks. It's not going. There might be a lot of suffering. And I, I, by the way, I don't think the church is ready for that either. Um, uh-huh. But at the end of the day, again, if those that are the remnant are taking the long look and they're believing that as bad as it is and as bad as it'll probably become, uh, the, the story is not over. This is not the end of the story. I think if you had that character, Colonel or Watcher, saying something to Brian that left him in, that would leave him in despair, it would be hard for you to not. And he actually responded in a bounce back and yeah, I, I could imagine that would be very hard to write dialogue, which you are great at, by the way. But it would be hard to find something to come out of his mouth that would not be the very cartoony thing that you're trying to avoid. Right. I would almost see it working on him and him falling into despair and hopelessness. And then you have the unlikely Melissa that comes along that pep talks him or that carries him through it or that takes charge and or punches the guy in the nose and says just the <laughs> thing that no easy Christian answer could have ever thought of. Yeah. She'd be the one to come up with the outside of the box thing that would metaphorically speak and kick him in between, you know? Yeah, but, well, he in, in the portent, he is not he's not going to be left in isolation because he can't. He can't do what needs to be done on the larger scale in a number of of regards, not just the intellectual part. He is going to need other people, and Melissa will be a big part of that. 
I, I, I can say this much. I mean, by the end of the book, regardless of what may or may not be with their relationship, and I'm being very noncommittal there for the sake of, of readers, uh, but at, at the end of the book, it, it will be clear that they together are sort of an indispensable team, that they really function best as a unit, not only with respect to them as individuals, but just for the bigger picture of, of what, what they're going to be left with as far as well, what do we do now, you know, kind of situation. He is going to need her and, and some other people to, to get by. Uh, sounds like it's very good themes, very deep themes. It sounds like it's just going to be brilliant. I can't wait to read it. We have a contest to announce, speaking of, relating to the portent. And I still have a couple of lingering questions in the back of my mind on it. But um, you were talking about whatever you said earlier, and you're like, you couldn't even be a pastor without insulting people. <laughs> it's almost like, speaking of insulting people, yes, let's do in, 2000, <laughs> in 2009, you gave this lecture in Roswell, Why an Extraterrestrial God Appeals to Today's Culture, which sort of touched on some of the themes mm -hmm. that you were talking about here, as far far as what are the worldviews out there? What is this post-Christian worldview that would be so susceptible to being deceived by intelligent evil via the UFO alien phenomena? And at the very end of it, you, you look right in the camera and you talk directly to pastors and you give them a little bit of a challenge. And what we're doing, we've got these DVDs in fancy cases and professional wrapping now just recently via Amazon and CreateSpace. So if it's okay with you, we'll pay for it. But we wanted to offer a contest for people. If you will follow whatever link we post or just go on Amazon, Mike Kaiser, Why an Extraterrestrial God Appeals to Today's Culture. The 2009 First Christian Symposium on Aliens talk that Dr. Heiser did. Order that, give it to a pastor, because that's whom he's addressing about the UFO alien phenomena and the worldviews that non-Christians and Christians are embracing or at least being exposed to today. Let us know you gave it to a pastor just by email. We're just going to trust you. And then we will enter you in for a drawing to get one of the first published copies of the portent signed by Mike. Yep, that's agreeable. Okay. Right on. Awesome. Do you have an ETA on when the portent might? I don't. Are you, are you a year away? Well, it, I, you know, I, I can give you my wish, but if I give you my wish, then that'll be that'll sort of become like the law of the Medes and the Persians. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it would it would be nice to have it uh, by ready by Christmas, but I don't know that that's going to happen. So, you know, it, it would be nice, but it may or may not. Who knows? It's an internet radio program that people will be listening to for months and months and months. So, <laughs> buy one of the new DVDs. You give it to a pastor, and you shoot us an email and let us know with your info, and we'll let you know if you won the drawing for an autographed copy of the portent. Right on. Uh, a question comes to mind, and you know we can edit this out if it's not appropriate for whatever. So we know Brian in both novels now is mm -hmm. sort of a lot like you. Mm -hmm. And now you just spoke this wonderful theme of Brian and Melissa having to be, they function best as a unit. But um, just because I've met Drina many times, she's a redhead. In the novel, Melissa <laughs> is a redhead too. Are there any direct correlations or ways that Melissa is in any way, shape, or form based on Drina that is obvious to you two or you when you're writing or when Drina's reading the novel herself? Uh, well, yeah, you bring up a couple of interesting things there. Um, you know, her natural color is, is not, you know, Auburn. She has had it that way, you know, several times, which I really like. Um, you know, and I keep getting after, you know, to, to do that again. Maybe maybe when the uh, the portent debuts, I'll, I'll be able to convince her to do that, and we can do something fun with it, like for a website. <laughs> uh, either, either that or, or, or buy, the, uh, buy the wig, you know, and have her do it. <laughs> Um, publicity photo for the book. Yeah, you two together. yeah. I, if if I ever mentioned that to our uh, to the director of marketing, he'd probably throw his influence behind that. <laughs> but uh, no, I characterize Melissa as being three people. One, of course, is is Drina. She's an amalgamation of three. One is Drina. One, of course, is uh, the the Dana Scully character. Uh, not necessarily Julian Anderson, of course, but the the character Dana Scully. And the other is a, a woman who I will not name because I just don't like her. So she got to that got to be the bad Melissa. <laughs> the bad. 
Okay. okay. There was somebody that there's just a personality issue there. So I th- sort of threw all three of those together, and you know, out came Melissa. Now, you know that the the bad Melissa is fading. It was fading at the end of the facade oh. and becoming more, um, you know, of the other two. So. But I imagine that she'll have flashes, you know, of, of the other, especially when she gets irritated with Brian's awkwardness, you know, different different points. But that, that's about all I'll say there. I'm sure I can't be the only one to have asked that question, no. even if they didn't ask it of you. Drina, does she hate that question, or does no, she just no, no? And, and about reading it, I mean, I I'm I'm really paranoid about the uh, sequel. Like I'll I'll be sitting there where I where I do my work, and if Drina walks behind me, I'll I'll reduce the I'll minimize the window. And <laughs> she's like, you know, will you knock it off? <laughs> <I'm not laughs> I just don't want any leaks, you know. No leaks at all. What about the um when we saw each other last in person here in town in Nashville? You mentioned to me that you had this real shady uh, Malone character hanging out in the background. What well, what's happening with him? Yeah, I, I I have named you know some characters off the old uh, in the the old beginning days of um, the, uh, the the Roswell stuff. You know, I've, I've taken taken some names from people I that were associated with that, and it, sort of at the beginning of all this. So yeah, there is a Malone character. He. Uh, I get. To, I'm a bad guy, right? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say. You know what? <laughs> what you are. Uh, you're the character is older than you are. I will say that. Um, probably. Probably a little more. Uh, well, I, I. I better not say that. <laughs> <laughs> he's not, he's oh, go old, ahead. And, it's fi- it's yeah. fiction. Say whatever. Brian, Brian pokes fun at him in one one scene and refers to him as Wilford Brimley, but uh, he doesn't like that. Quaker <laughs> Oatmeal Cap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he was lurking in the shadows at he's some older. point. That's all you ever told me. What is is yeah, he in age? He was he was um, tailing tailing Brian and Melissa. Okay. Yeah, un- unbeknownst to them, of course. So. Sounds like something I'd do. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not. He was watching. So there's when you said based on Roswell, are you talking about people you met in Roswell or the Roswell incident? Oh no, pe- people I met there. You know, associated with the like the first or second conference. You know, the, like I said, the early days. Have you told them? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've told uh, I've told some of them. Um, you know, the the, the uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to go through the cast of characters here. Not everybody has a, a, a name of somebody I know. Uh, my four kids uh, are, are named in there. They have sort of cameo appearances. Um, That's cool. My names. Um, and of course, they're not the, the characters. Not always like you know, one could be an adult, but I just give them the name, that kind of thing. So um, I'm trying to think if there's yeah, there are a few people. There are two characters named after fans. One is is deceased now, unfortunately. Um, but she has a, a character named after her. And then there's there's another one who I met on Facebook. She said she read the book like six or seven times, and I thought, man, that deserves some kind of recognition here. So I needed I needed somebody that you know I needed somebody younger, and so I, I asked her if I could use her her name as a character. But you know, letting her know I don't know if this is a good person a bad person i don't know if they live or die so you might end up dying a horrible death but i don't know it's just uh but she was fine you know with that so there are two that are named after fans oh that's great i like what you're revealing about the writing process here is you don't know how this person turns out whether they live or die or in some cases you can't predict where the plot is going until you're in the present at least in the novel the writing but yeah, kind of uh, that's true. Uh, you know, you, you hear this old you know bromide about um, you know, well, when you're writing a novel, the the characters just sort of take over the story and take on a life of their own. Take on a life, yeah, that that's actually true. I have found, and it, and it, it's true in this way that you'll be going along and you'll you'll hit some point in the story and you'll really have boxed yourself in because you want something to happen and the, the people in the room, so to speak, you, you look at them and you go, nobody here would say that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, nobody here would do that. That's just completely out of character. You know, and so you have to scrap it or you have to change it or, and you actually do get directed by these, these fictional people, you know, that, that you've created. That really does happen. Happened a number of times in the facade and, and, and in, in the portent. You know, I, I don't know. I, I I know one or two characters that are probably doomed. <laughs> but, you know, 
it could be more, you know, it, I, I just, I don't know yet. It, it, it'll just sort of hit me, you know, as I go through again, it's, it's, I have my own, you know, for the sake of the book, I have my own items that I want to cover. I, there are things I want to do. There are technologies I want to talk about. There's theological issues I want to bring into it. There's all this post-Christian world and all this, what does it all mean? You know, it, it, so you get your head into that and you, you come up with a way to communicate certain ideas and, and then you have to, you have to punctuate the thing with, with characters, you know, with real people and things need to happen. And, you know, and some of them are, are really bad. And so they're going to do, you know, things that are consistent with their own character in that way. And so it, it sort of invents itself. There is, there is that element to be sure. Creative genius, God inspired, leaving room for that. It sounds uh, great. I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say, I think you can rule the second one of those out, but and and the, the the first one also seems like a a, a wing and a prayer. But <laughs> oh, you're just so, being humble. So you leave room for for God to work. Because I mean, this is not just a fiction book. This is teaching. No, you know? you're right. You're right. I mean, there. You know, Brian, of course, you know, is 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 sort of a spiritual center. But there there are going to be other characters in the portent. There already are. But they'll they'll take on more significance in that way in that role um, because he's he's going to need he's going to need some direction he's going to need some people to you know give him a kick in the pants now and again and there are, there are characters who will who will do that and so yeah there is there's certainly a lot of intent there as well and just pray God does inspire throughout it you know I think this really is going to highlight some topics and their importance. And highlight the importance of this this field to a lot of people reading it and learn a lot through it. So I just really pray God blesses everything you're doing with it. The well, Lord willing, yeah, we pray that too, and we hope that'll be the case. You said Brian is going to need a little more mentoring, obviously, and we know from the first book that he's already lost his two main mentor people. And just an odd question. We did a program recently talking about the different types of churches that are in existence today, where we just talked back and forth, but it's all still one body. It's who Jesus calls his church. A question, I'll say 10 years ago when I read the facade the first time, and you were making one of the heroic characters and good guys from a Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. I found myself way more on the Protestant side, wanting, you know, feeling that was wrong. <laughs> you can't make Catholics the good guys. I'm curious, over 10 years, have you heard, have you caught any flack from people, Protestants, that were like, oh, nothing good in Catholicism. Why did you make a hero out of a priest or anything? You know, Does that know, come up, or is it you just know, me? It has not come up. That, that's that's really an interesting question. It, it, it has not come up. Uh, it, you know, in the facade, you know, when M Melissa sort of pokes at Brian in that regard and and says something, I, th I think she might just point out, point blank, say, so is Father Benedict going to hell? You know, and and Brian's, you know, response is really, you know, dealing with the whole, you know, faith and works kind of thing. Basically, that what what's important is that you you can't be you can't be believing the gospel if you think that you merit the grace of God in any way. I mean, you you can say things like, and I you know I don't know what the dialogue is in the facade. I'd have to look, but um, you can say things as a Protestant like works are essential to salvation, but they are not the meritorious cause. They're essential because James says they are, and you know we can talk about what he means. If you put Ephesians two and James together, for by grace are you saved through faith without works is dead. Put those two sentences together, those two verses, and it's very thought provoking. And of course, Brian has been down that road in his thinking, and, and I have as well. Um, so that's why he answers the way he does. You know, you, we, we can argue about the relationship of faith and works, but the bottom line is, is you cannot think that you merit salvation in any way. And so I don't care what you are. I don't care what label you stick on yourself. You can call yourself a, a Catholic or whatever, a, a fundamentalist, an evangelical, whatever. You know, can you look me in the eye and say, you know, I don't, you know, we're going to agree on, on how to define certain things, but I believe that Jesus died for me and that I cannot merit my salvation in any way. Okay? It, it, it's all by him and through him. If you can say that, I don't care what label you're wearing, that's the gospel. And I have to assume that you're being genuine with me when you tell me that that is what you believe. That, that's where your face is at. Uh, and for somebody like Benedict, 
you know, there are there are other things in the book where, you know, he's not he's not a Protestant, but he's he's not a dyed in the wool party line kind of guy either you know, when it when it comes to that. So, you know, his the conversations there with Brian, I think, at least for Brian and for readers, tell you where Brian is at and basically saying, look, if this is where Andrew's at, I think I'm going to see him in heaven. You know, if, if he's not, then then he believes something else, you know. And so I, I think that that conversation with Melissa about that issue has has sort of framed the character of Benedict, you know, in, in, in such a way where it, it gives a, it gives the reader something to think about, even though, you know, this, this guy's a priest or he's Catholic or whatever. You know, if he really believes that, then that is the gospel. And if, if he doesn't, well, I, I'm, I'm sad about that. I don't feel like I've won a contest, you know, because Benedict becomes a likable guy, you know, mm-hmm. in the book, people root for him. They, they know that, he, you know, when his cards are on the table, he's on the right side. His final line was brilliant. Right. Give it away because I'm sure people are going to read the facade for the first time after this. Yeah. Sorry to let you know he died, folks. Oops. <laughs> spoiler. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. But yeah, Benedict, Benedict is is a really important character um, and somebody you know I wanted to I wanted to have that theological discussion to that extent you know the whole you know well how what what really is the gospel what does it come down to really. And I and I use Melissa for that when when she challenges him, you know, about uh, the whole the whole Catholic thing, because that's her background too. Her background is very non-Catholic. Then of course I put them at a Catholic school, you know, which I I thought important. Was fun. Important. Yeah. How funny. <laughs> Yeah. See, this is why you are so not marketable by a Christian public. <laughs> well, I mean, these issues and the way you do it, well, and and who else some of the characters, sure. some of the characters. There's a cuss word in there. Um, <laughs> there's a steamy scene. <laughs> yeah, who, who else is Father Benedict going to ask? You know, these, these are his contacts, and he's he's protecting them. And this is this is how it's going to work. And so they have they have to play the part. Um, you know, it's it's not it's not that there re, you know, there's not a lot required of them, but they are in that context. And, and so yeah, that that's going to create a little bit of awkwardness. I don't rabbit trail too much on on that, other than to let people know that they don't quite fit here really in any regard. <laughs> I remember you told me once, probably on the phone when we were discussing this years ago, as far as how your book is so different from the average Christian book, is that you purposely avoided the obligatory conversion scene. Oh, Everybody yeah. expects they're going to see Melissa get saved by the end of the book or profess Christ, repent, whatever. But you specifically said that you purposely avoided the obligatory conversion scene. Mm-hmm. That's got me thinking... Okay, they are living together. They are holding out that they are married in front of everybody. How or are you going to handle the obligatory first kiss scene? (laughs) (laughs) The obligatory first kiss scene. What do I want to say? You might just have to. Well... Because you've you've said that you're very noncommittal about where their relationship actually goes. Yeah, I, but I everybody I, expects a romance. It's got to culminate, or does it? Well, I, I I want I want there to be some sort of resolution, and that that's a very vague word. I realize, um, but I I, I want um, I want that question. You know what? What do they think of of each other? I want that question answered because I think readers want to know that. Um, but again, I, I, I know how to answer that question and I know how to continue the, um, the uncertainty and the tension, uh, that's still there. Um, I, I, in fact, actually just wrote something like that for that obligatory first kiss. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I can't, I'm obviously, I'm not going to say anything about that. Oh, no, no. Um, see, if you extend this onto a third book though, you could have a whole little fan base of shippers and no romos out there. Yeah. Yeah. Arguing yeah. For whether they get together, the whole Mulder and Scully thing. Well, I, again, it, it, it's only as good as what, what, what made the Mulder and Scully thing work was people, people knew that they were absolutely, unquestionably loyal to each other. Yeah. And and people want that. They they want that in relationships. You know, in in their romantic relationships, they they want to know that there's this one person out there that just would, in a heartbeat, would just you know give their lives for them. I mean, they just absolute unquestioned loyalty uh, to each other. And so that that's important. You know, with with the the Brian and Melissa thing. 
but but then the, the other side, there there were these again because of a number of factors when it comes to the X Files. There were there were impediments to to anything else. Uh, you know that you know, we get into psychologically, especially with Mulder. But they did it well. You know, I, I think it it was actually a, a mistake. You know, toward the end of the series to to put them together in the way that they were put together. Um, so can can I can I convey the the first thought again? There's just there's no question that uh, they they are just absolutely dedicated to each other. And then can I can I retain or both both retain and propel and impede? Uh, anything more, and and I I believe I know how to do that. So they'll certainly develop, spiritually speaking. You know, the, the, Melissa's just going to have to, you know, it's there's no obligatory conversion prayer or anything like that. You can dispense with that. But but she's she's going to have this sort of come to Jesus thinking, not not a moment, but but thinking that that has already begun in in the first yeah. book. You know, where where she she is confronted with. Um, with the notion that this thing I hate, you know, I, I, I ought to hate it because evil was done to me, but this thing I hate is something of a caricature that, that I have helped create. And Brian becomes sort of the reference point to, uh, to jolt her, you know, in, 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 into thinking, thinking more carefully about, you know, what, what should I hate? What shouldn't I hate? You know, what should I embrace? What shouldn't I embrace? You know, the, those sorts of things in, in just in her, the way she's thinking spiritually. And so he, he's going to have that effect on her, but, you know, we're not going to have prayer meetings. We're not going to have, you know, home Bible studies. We're not going to do any of that. They're, Romans road. Right. They're, they're, right. They're, they're just going to be two people who they're in this situation and they they are just they are all in when it when it comes to each other and that that's going to that's going to affect both of them in in different ways you know and, and uh, the the relationship will will develop where there will be some point you know in, in the book that you know it, it comes out you know, here's here's where I am here's where we stand and now we need to go on with our life and hope that we don't get killed. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Oh, I, Look forward to how you work it out. I think that's great. That it's, it's the love there that's really motivating her to change and reconsider everything. Not not a prayer meeting or a Bible study right. or anything. That relationship with Brian. Yeah, it's a yeah, it, it's a person. It's a relationship, and he's never he's never pushy. He he accepts her as she is, and you know has to be real careful on a number of reasons, a number of levels. You know. Part of it's her. Part of it is just his own really poor self-image um, that he has to he has to deal with. And, and you know she's gonna she's gonna rattle his cage there too. Right on. You know that that's part of her role, and, and she knows how to do it really well. Um, my my favorite scenes are the two of them. Uh, you know, having a conversation just far and away. Uh, I, I I love to to just be in the room. <laughs> It's it's just a lot of fun, you know, to to go back and forth between the, those two. Um, that dynamic is part of what makes it such a beautiful piece of work. Um, I will well, say people like it. I did. We do. And to your credit, since maybe you never get to defend yourself publicly, I know you've said this before, just to me, to anybody, since we talked way early at the beginning when we got on the phone about the fact that the cliffhanger the book ends on is Melissa is pregnant and they don't know how yet. To Michael's credit, anybody that's just now joining this facade world and hearing of Mike Heiser is he had that in print way before it happened on the X-Files. Yeah, that, that is true. Just, well, <laughs> season six or something, I don't even know, yeah, I, with Mike had already written that and published it in hard copy before it was on television. Yeah. The X-Files. When, uh, one, when we were in Madison, you know, of course, this is after the book's out, uh, Doug came over uh, to where I was working one night. I, I had a, a security job. And he came over to the, it was at a biotech firm, and they had a, a an auditorium where I'd, I'd go in on Sunday nights and watch the X-Files, just me in this big auditorium. You know? And I, because I was taping them too, you know, I, I was allowed to do that. And Doug came along and, and we watched, and it happened to be that episode where Scully finds out, you know, she's pregnant. And when, and when they hit that line, Doug and I just looked at each other like, I can't believe it. Right. He says, we need to go out and get the manuscript notarized. Or something. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, he, we were just sort of stunned that uh, that the show, you know, went that direction, you know, especially, you know, because it was already in the uh, in the facade. But anyway, you know, we I feel like you're being watched. <laughs> <laughs> No, always, always. Well, as as, uh, as as Father Benedict said to uh, Brian when the, the first time they meet, and you know, Benedict says, "Hey, you know, I I just want to let you know I I've read your dissertation." And Brian says, well, "I had no idea anybody was paying attention." And, and remember what Benedict says to him? Yeah, I was going to bring it up earlier. The Pope has read your. Yeah, no, oh, the Pope the, the Pope read it too. Yeah, and and, and Benedict was... says, "There's always someone paying attention. You, know, you would you would do well to remember that." <laughs> Should we about wrap this up? I don't know. Sure. Yeah, we've a couple hours yeah, a longer couple than we yeah. Um Great insights. Thanks for sharing with us. Perhaps maybe we were able to draw more out of you, having read the book a few times. Thanks for sharing with us a lot of points. I know you probably haven't uh, with others yet anyway. is That's true. Can- cool. I like doing that. I want you to give your website addresses and things. If you've just heard of the facade for the first time, how do you get a copy of this special edition facade book? And as well as your blogs, that was one thing we were going to focus on, on some really... Yeah, we can do that some other time. Yeah. I would say for me. yeah, for any, to find out more information about me and, of course, the facade and, and everything else that I'm involved in, the best thing to do is to go up to my homepage, which is www. DRMSH.com. That's a redirect that will take you to my homepage. DR, as in doctor, DRMSH.com. And at the top, there will be links to all my blogs and other websites, things about Zechariah Sitchin and, and whatnot. And then on the left-hand side of that page, there will also be a series of links, and you will be able to find a link to the facade on that page and go right to where you can order the book. I would also recommend that people follow me on Twitter uh, and also follow at least the UFO Religions blog because as news, you know, as I have updates on the portent, I will post things on UFO Religions and also via Twitter. And it's fascinating. Fantastic blog for anyone. It's in new you followed you'd be following anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, something new comes out every other day or so. Thanks for sharing so much time with us, so much information. And if anybody, uh, this is 2013, February right now. If anybody wants to know how to get one of the very first copies of The Portent in your hands, signed by Mike Kaiser, that DVD we mentioned is at ancientofdays.net. Uh, just click on and buy a copy of Mike's 2009 talk. Give it to your pastor and just email us to let us know that you've done so. The talk was why an extraterrestrial God appeals to today's culture. And I think a lot of it has to do with why this belief in aliens is so pervasive in the world today and what the church maybe could or should know and could or should would be doing about it. Yeah, and drop us an email and let us know. Kids, so be entered in the drawing. Yeah, I got my own prophecy views, but maybe that's something after you get done with the port and maybe... Maybe then. Yeah, I'll love to see if, if you two get to go round and round. Nicole's got some very, uh, well, insightful, but also, wait a minute, we can know, and here's how we can know, and here's what we can know. and That'd be fun to watch so, you two go. <laughs> yeah, some of what we got into is, like, just touching right on the edge of that. But Yeah, I could kind of tell. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, you know, it's you got you got to be a little out of the box, I think, to even say anything meaningful. <laughs> When it comes mm-hmm. when it comes to eschatology, it just you know I think people are people are a little too settled, um, yeah, and I, mean, I don't think it's a good thing. Yeah, I didn't bring it up. 2005, that was the same view I was taking. Flexibility in your eschatology. If something happens that you weren't planning on, are you still going to believe in God? And most, you know, we didn't understand this stuff except with hindsight. And, you know, after Jesus rose and the church began, nobody even saw the church coming in prophecy. Yet it's all over. So, I mean, I agree with you. I just didn't want to, like, toot my own horn as, yes, Mike, that's what I've been saying for years. Well, cool. <laughs> I, I think that a process of elimination can really help if you – yeah, because I see cool and cyclic and fractal prophecies, but I think if you can eliminate the ones that have already had a literal fulfillment of what you're left with, if you connect it up, you can make an educated guess or, or connect things so much better than – the direction a lot of people have taken with it. So well, I, I will say I, I think I think that basically we're all there. It's all guesses, but some guesses are better than others. 
Oh, that, well, that we, we would have loved to have you say. Nicole's got great work on. Well, you can edit that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Find a home for that. We will. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and when it comes to editing, editing things out, is there anything you want me to edit out? Stick no, mind? no, not specifically. Just don't uh, do not do the History Channel a hack job like they did on Guy. So. Uh, well, you, uh, I see that. No. Church, dumb as a box of rocks. I could take that out <laughs> Did you want? No, he really wants that. Well, in. I said, I said, some people. You know what? If I, if I if I haven't offended anyone in an interview, I haven't done my job. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do want it. Mike's probably going to go out and buy church as dumb as a box of rocks dot com. <laughs> thinking about it while he's thinking about it. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm at GoDaddy right now, so. <laughs> All right, well, I, that's how the show should end. We should edit that conversation back in. <laughs> I got to I gotta get going. Thank you, yeah. man. God bless um, you. Yep. Well, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. Yep. This has been great. Yep. This is Coffee with Alien Resistance. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.